Hello. Hello. <laughs> that was the Jerry Cats. Yeah. From McCallowit in none of it, and uh, boy oh boy, yeah, that makes me want to move. A totally rocking combination of throat singing and uh, rock and roll, and it was great. Yep. Okay. Welcome everyone. Okay, so the annotation is up and running. So please go ahead and tell us where the differences are. Ah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> well uh. done. <laughs> so apparently there are nine. Are we getting nine? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we've got to switch musical references now back to the 1970s and Sesame Street. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Okay. Time machine. Do you, Do you think we've got them all? Do you want to see the answers? I think you want to see the answers. It's going to happen. It's queued it's up. It's going to happen. The answers are queued up and ready to go. So let me just hear. So you just try and express that you don't want to see the answers. Yeah. In which case. <laughs> Watch me. <laughs> uh, hold on one second. There we go. Cool. Here are the answers. Um, did you get them all? Wow. Some of them are... Pretty. I feel as though this slide has been moved. <laughs> okay, so maybe they're not all exactly I'm getting lost where they're in the supposed parsley, to be. But there's yeah. two differences in the parsley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, good job. <laughs> oh, maybe the problem is that there is parsley. Ah, nobody wants nobody parsley. Wants parsley. <laughs> Sign in in the chat if you'd like some parsley. With your and I will eject you from the chat. <laughs> okay, cool. Welcome, everyone. Um, uh, let's talk seriously because this is the time of year where the vibe in this classroom can change just mm. a little bit. So everyone's been like super chill. So I, you're all amazing, but you're going to get stressed because of the topic test that's coming up and that's fine. Um, and you'll hate us for a little while and that's totally fine. But let us tell you that there you will, oh, well, the, it'll be like your first, is, I think this is like your first like midterm test, like in university for most of you. Um, and um, you're not going to get the mark that you're hoping for and everything will be okay. Because in our course, because our topic tests are challenging, they're applied, and we're going to show you some example questions today and all of that stuff. Um, and we have an asynchronous study tool that we will launch on Friday morning. We're like, we got you. But um, because this is your first one, because you're not going to do super you know, well, you're going to be like, what do I expect? Who are these people that are marking me? And like, why are they writing these questions? We drop the lowest grade of the topic, the three topic tests. Okay, so you get a freebie. If you're sick, that's your freebie. If you forget it, that's your freebie. If you do really crappy, that's your freebie. And it's just part of our way of supporting all 700 of you. Um, with, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, but there you go, okay? So um, I would strongly recommend that you do your best to take it. Even if you do shitty on it, you're gonna learn how we write questions, which means you're gonna study differently for the next one. Okay, um, so please, uh, if you can, take it. We made it on Thursday instead of Friday before the, the holiday um, so that, um, you know, uh, more of you will perhaps be around. It is online. Uh, you can access it between a window, right? Nine, window. 9 to 6 p.m. But if you want the full three hours, you won't need it. But if you want the full three hours, you have to sign in by 3 p.m., okay? Because it close, you can't sign in at 5 p.m. and think that you're going to have until 8. Okay? And some of you will fuck this up, and we will work with you. But do not like, fuck this up. Like a seal? Right. I think we, we, will we fuck skipped this into... Up. Yeah, oh, there you go. Seal. Seal, right there. Sorry. Okay. Um, anyway, so, okay? The reason why it's between 9 and 6 is because we will be available to answer your questions. So you can write to the course um, email address and we will be there monitoring, doing our best to get back to you as soon as possible, right? 
Um, so, uh, yeah, so we're not going to do it until 10 PM or midnight because we're not going to be available, but like between nine and six, that's why, because everyone deserves to be able to ask questions. There are questions in the chat about whether we're going to be using respondents. Let's, no! let's, let's mute and be like, not at all. No, that is an entirely inappropriate and racist bit of software that you should not ever racist. be exposed to. So. Um, if you go onto the Reddit, I have posted instructions on how to petition your professor to not use Respondus based on human rights um, uh, concerns. Uh, if you uh, if you want some time today in the chat, I will also post the link to how to do that, um, and I will support you. Once you get a totally disappointing response from your professor that is equally racist, get in touch with me, and I will help you write the re re reply. Yep, there's people that are uh, commenting on some courses uh, that rhyme with blem. Um, <laughs> uh, is going to. Uh, yeah. Yep, racist and ableist as well. You yeah. have got it. Totally. So when it says open book, does that mean we are allowed to use sources off course link? Can we use our yes. notes? Yes, yes. Yes. It's like the internet. Crack. You cannot use um, academic misconduct websites. Yeah. And trust me, the answers are pretty terrible, so you don't even yeah. want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, let me just say, <laughs> let us just say, the people that are selling their yeah. answers to those services, they're not helping. They're not too bright. Okay, okay, so lots of information, don't worry. Um, Ms. Bingham is going to be here for the student hours to answer all of your questions. We have, I have to run at 10 o'clock. Yeah. This one's going to stay until 1030, but anyway, Ms. Bingham's got you covered. More importantly, though, we do need to talk about this. Um, Could I ask some more questions here? Oh, Just yeah. Just a long answer or multiple choice. They're predominantly multiple choice. Yeah, they're kind of true and false. Yeah, really. so even even like of that variety. Yeah. As you're preparing for this, remember, you're, you've been prepared by doing the in-class uh, polls. That's the yeah. kind of thing that we're writing. Yeah. This is more important, though. This is for now, yes, more immediately and sort of consistently important in our lives. Um, please join us, uh, if you can, uh, for any of the multiple events that are happening on Friday uh, to mark National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, knowing that it is not just a one-day event. It is something that we need to be bringing with us all the time. Yeah, and it is the, it is, it's all the time, uh, and it is, in fact, this whole week there are, there are events. Uh, I think our campus, we have them focused on the Friday. That's right. So um, please uh, learn about what's available. Things are posted on the websites um, with respect to all of the different activities and opportunities to learn uh, and engage um, with um, uh, our history of genocide. Moving on specifically to the residential school system uh, in terms of specifically how we uh, ran out our program for genocide. There is a an applet on the CBC's news site uh, that lets you calculate the distance from where you're sitting uh, to the closest residential school. This is the spread of them uh, as they were across the country, and it'll tell you in the next slide. I'll look, for example, we're sitting here in Guelph, uh, and the closest one is about 52 kilometers south of us, and it was in, let's call it horribly, business. Uh, yeah. the business of genocide until 1970. You'll be surprised if you move yourself around or if you talk about maybe not from Guelph, um, but where you grew up. Mine, the closest to where I grew up uh, in the, uh, just outside of Algonquin Park was running until the mid eighties. Um, it would have affected people that I was playing hockey with and against. Yeah. And I was um, privilegedly unaware yeah. and it, it let us not be that way anymore. Yep. And one of the things that we need to do is talk a little bit about sort of the difference between performative allyship um, and more sort of allyship that, that engages action. Um, and so uh, I want to share this with you. Uh, when we write land acknowledgments, it is really important to make sure that they are uh, deeply personal and coming from a place of reflection. Um, that you've done some work um, and that you're not copying and pasting uh, these statements. Um, and so uh, what I'd like to share with you is my land acknowledgement. 
uh, which incorporates my experience as a biologist, which incorporates uh, my commitment to action and the policies that I practice every single day. Um, so I'll read it to you, um, and uh, here it is. So as biologists, we research and learn from the land and waters of many indigenous communities. We must learn about and respect the different traditions that are home to the lands that we live and travel on. This means that we must study these places as invited people. We must seek and respect permission. We have a responsibility to leave what we learn with value in each place. And for me, this means that I have a responsibility to weave in the knowledge that exists on these lands with the knowledge that we seek to create. As a settler, this means that I must work to make my research programs inclusive and accessible because these are things that I should not and cannot do alone. If you are in Guelph, you are on the ancestral lands of the Attawaran people and the treaty lands of the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. So here, what this means is that within my research program, um, I have worked really hard to reduce barriers to access to um, Indigenous students that are coming in. Um, my work focuses on the Arctic, uh, and so I am engaged actively in conversations with the community of Ikalatuktuak, uh, which is in English is uh, Cambridge Bay, um, to uh, make sure that students are able to access our courses, access our programs. Um, and uh, I am delighted to say that so far uh, we have been able to welcome uh, several students into the lab group um, and uh, one uh, resident of Cambridge Bay. Uh, Brian is my master's student and he's been there uh, in my lab for the last year and a half and he will hopefully be graduating in December. He is fantastic. He is asking questions about invasive species, uh, recognizing that invasive species, um, the definition uh, is very broad uh, and requires a cultural lens, which I think is fantastic. So um, we have to think about what this actually means in our day-to-day -day practices as biologists. Um, and, uh, and there you go. So uh, think about this, it's important stuff. And we're going to be... Last question about Thursday. Oh, Thursday. Uh, if they have a Next seminar Thursday. on Thursday, mm -hmm. do the, does it take place? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Ooh, let's get into Reading Trees 2.0, please. Okay. More terms, more, more terms. examples. We're going to fly through them. Yeah. So. That's a pun. <laughs> it's going to be a pun in about 45 minutes. <laughs> Here's a challenging question, like a challenging, challenging question. Um, so I'm going to put it up in the poll. Please don't annotate on the screen. Let everyone come up with their own answer. Um, here we go. Question. There we go. Okay, we'll give you a few minutes. What sound is rocketing through your head? Whoa, 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 whoa. Mind you, different key, but saying like. I cannot get enough of the Lampsilis lures. I know. They're bananas. No, see, they're not bananas. They're, <laughs> they're fish. They're little fish. <laughs> if it was a banana, that would be even weirder. Like, amazing. <laughs> it would catch Shh, our children. They're working. <laughs> Shh, they're working.
Okay, just another few more seconds. 83% uh, of you have, have clicked in. That's great. Okay. 10 more seconds. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to end the poll right now. I'm going to share the results with you and then bring it on over here so we can see uh, most of you did get the correct answer. Uh, so uh, we're looking for the statement that is not supported, right? Um, and uh, the other ones are uh, supported in some way. So what we'd like you to do is um, even if you got the right answer, make sure that you're able to explain why all of the other ones are supported. What is the mechanism that we're driving in on? The, the, basically, this is an expression of the application of a concept. So go in and uh, make sure that you can explain why uh, each of the other ones are supported and why uh, the last one here is not supported. If you have any questions, put them on the discussion board. We will make sure that we get to them. But we do have to move on because we've got stuff to do and all of that stuff. Okay. And you can also obviously pop them in the chat too. Okay. Cool. Are we good? Yeah? I hope. Some uh, rolling in questions about the exam, the topic test rather. Again, uh, whether content will be of a lecture and or pre-reading. And so it's like, it's, it's the stuff. Yeah. But a reminder as you're preparing yourself that it will not be a topic test where we're like, uh, tell us which species of muscle has a lure or no, no, no. The details that are contained in these examples will be given to you if they occur in yep. the topic test, yep. in the question. And then the tests will be about you synthesizing, connecting dots, examples, dots, and demonstrating that you understood the concepts. Not the, not can you remember how many species of muscle there are. It's like no. super, yeah. the great. That's great. Okay. Um, so there is no main line of evolution. Oftentimes when we think about, you know, evolution, we put humans like right over here at the top of the tree. Bum, bum, um, bum. And just remember that we can rotate these nodes and put humans in the middle of the tree. <laughs> Um, and there's sort of no main line. It's really important to recognize that. We are not the epitome of evolution. We uh, are a consequence of you know, random mutation that got selected for um, and uh, adaptations that accumulated and all of those things. But it's really important to make sure that we recognize that, first of all, we are a relatively new species on this planet. Um, and that um, bacteria have been evolving for the same amount of time as we have. Um, it's just that the selection pressures have been different, okay? Really important to, to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and then also uh, the whole idea about the same amount of time. So we've, we've uh, seen this one before, um, that all of these letters add up to the same amount of time, right? Um, and uh, really important to recognize that, that there are some potentially arguable differences in complexity uh, or the number of structures that are involved in our bodies and things like this. Um, the number of separate units and compartments, right, that can be selected for, which I think is just awesome and you'll learn more about um, in 2700 um, but that doesn't mean that something is more evolved okay yeah we're going to be spending a lot of time today talking about that common and common in the general public like yeah. when you go if you go home for thanksgiving uh, this might be common around the table as you talk about your your courses people will think about well yeah evolution okay it's like accumulating complexity and and da da da, da. it's like there's so many examples where it's like you get close enough to a pretty good answer and then you just start shedding baggage yeah it's 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 kind of like a relationship yeah so some questions about traits, right? And remember, we're, we're kind of being pretty loose with the word trait, right? A trait can be... Inclusive. Uh, we're being inclusive. We're being inclusive. Trait. <laughs> it has a wide... Yeah, a definition. wide definition. So the trait is a thing that you can observe. Um, and so... Uh, so it could be singing. 
Yes, it could be the number of be, hearts that you have. It could be hair. It could be hair color. Pres presence or absence. <laughs> it could be all sorts of things, right? Um, and a trait can also be sort of external from your body, right? Mm. It could be something that you build um, or a relationship that you have, okay? And we'll show you what all of that means. So some questions we could ask is when did it evolve? Um, and we can do a phylogenetic analysis of trait evolution and make predictions or hypotheses about when something evolved. Can I break that down? Yeah, exactly. The, this is the yeah. thing. So by doing that kind of phylogenetic analysis, which might sound complicated, uh, really we're talking about looking at the tree and painting these traits, their occurrence, their first appearance, their, their disappearance perhaps, onto the tree. It's like adding fruit. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, it, gosh, it's powerful. Yeah, and fun. Um, okay, we can ask whether or not the treat has evolved independently. What does that mean? Huh, we'll let you know. So, if it evolved uh, from a common ancestor, it was inherited from a common ancestor, we call that a homology. Or a homologous trait. Right. Um, if it evolved independently, we call that homoplasy. Okay. Oh, homoplasious trait. Mm, yeah, yeah, we're going to give you some words and then we're going to give you a thing that you can do at the end today to like understand how all these words fit together. Okay. But we're also going to show you some stuff. Okay. Also possible that the trait has been lost in some lineages and we will show you what that looks like. So my trait is my phone. That's right. So, and we can have gains later of the trait if the genetic code for that trait hasn't been fully destroyed, right? If it's just the gene that's been turned off, it could actually reappear um, or it could evolve independently. It's all very complex and wonderful and beautiful, okay? So basically, when you see something, when you make an observation about something, there are multiple explanations that can get you there, right? Uh, the presence of eyes, right? Could be independent evolution. It could be inherited from a common ancestor. When something has lost its eyes, it doesn't mean that it's not closely related to things that have eyes. It could have lost the trait, or it never could have had it to begin with, in which case then you would have to rearrange the tree. And, and so it's about sort of multiple hypotheses that you need to then test, okay? So an observation doesn't necessarily yield an obvious single answer until you do further research. Yep. Cool. And so what, um, you know, a trait tree might look like is something like this, right? Where things are organized based on the assumption that there was a common ancestor, that this is a homologous relationship. These are homologous traits, okay? Um, so we can put vertebrae uh, probably down near the bottom, right? Because all of the things above have vertebrae followed by a bony skeleton that gets rid of our sharks and, and cartilaginous fish, right? Um, followed by four limbs, followed by an amniotic egg. And then we have this like break off these two post orbital, or orbital fenestrae, as well as hair, these types of things. Okay. And this is what a trait tree, like a large scale trait tree might look like. But what we want to do is challenge you a little bit. So remember, we said uh, tree thinking 2.0. So this is going to be fun. It's going to be hard. It is not meant for you to be able to like go, oh, obviously it's this, this and this, right? It's just to kind of get your brain into that space of being deeply uncomfortable and going, wow, that's OK. I understand what the implications are. So if you're if you're uncomfortable, it's OK. We're all uncomfortable. So here we go. When we think about muscles, right, and we think about all of these are like different clumps of different species, okay, and they're all like seemingly different, but they're all muscles, right? Trying to figure out the tree uh, and the relationship that these have is perhaps a little bit more challenging than what we showed you before with our like large scale, big like hair and vertebrae kind of a kind of a tree. How do we start to like understand which ones of these muscles are more closely related uh, and which ones are not? Um, and uh, before we kind of dive into something that is like not at all uh, undergraduate biology level, let's make things a little bit more simple. OK, let's just focus on a couple of traits um, and you'll see still it's challenging. So 
What we want to do uh, is pretend that we have six species of mussels. And what we want you to try to do is to come up with a tree, okay? Um, more importantly, though, is to take note of what questions you are asking yourself as you come up with this tree. So here's what the tree or what the six species of mussels can look like. They vary by shell shape as well as by shell color. Those are the only two traits where they vary, okay? And what we want you to do is, is like literally like open up another screen or a notepad or uh, get a pen or pencil or whatever and see if you can come up with a tree, okay? I'll just give you a minute. Oh, I've got to run soon. I don't want to. Um, I can be late. Um, just see if we can come up, come up with a tree. Where is the advice? You said it was... Oh, yeah, good. Um, here, I'll get it. I'll get the advice. You come up with the tree, I will get the advice. Are you good? <laughs> okay. So as you're trying to like go through this, we have two traits. How many of you started by organizing them into shell shape. If you did that, can you just give me a stamp on the left hand side of the screen on the sh on the muscles is totally fine, right? Just give me a stamp on the muscles. If you started with shell shape, you organized basically one and five and then four and three and two and six together. Okay. How many of you started with color? Give me a stamp on the other side, on the right hand side. So you organized three and five and two and four and one and six together. Excellent. Okay, so most of you started with shape. Think about that. If you started with shape and you grouped one and five together, right? And then you grouped, and they're sister taxa, right? And then you grouped two and six together, and those are sister taxa. And then you grouped four and three together, and those are sister taxa. What does that imply about color? What's the assumption there about color? Pop it in the chat or write on my screen, please. What is, what's the assumption there? Yeah. Yeah. Vulcans. Very, is it I Vulcans? Oh, very cool name. Okay. Um, yeah. The assumption is that, so if you grouped it by shell shape, it means the assumption is that color evolved independently at least once, right, within the tree. If you organized it by color, you're making the assumption that shell shape evolved independently. We don't have any reason based on these data to decide which one it is, right? Um, but just understand the assumption that comes from that when you choose to conserve a trait versus um, and the effects that it has on the other traits or the assumptions that it makes about the other traits. And of course, we know that animals, organisms, muscles, don't just have two traits, right? So <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna increase the complexity um, and not expect you to be able to you know come up with a tree in the next two minutes, but just appreciate associated with adding another trait. So here's another trait. Um, 
We're having a, a internet problem. Who is? I am. Okay, here's another trait. Um, lure shape. Now try to come up with a tree. And if you want to study and do this, that would be great. And here's another trait. Remember, we said that the traits can be external to our bodies. It could be about a relationship. Oh, uh, we're having a real, sorry, we're having like a real challenge. Um, there we go. Here's another trait, the relationship that we have with host fish. Okay, um, it, uh, it's a trait. So the host fish uh, and the relationship that you have with that host fish, that's a trait, especially if there's all of these variations, right? If some species are really good at attracting some, some species of fish while others are better at attracting other species of fish. Those are traits that can be put onto an evolutionary tree. So let's assume that based on all of that information, this is the tree, okay? It's not obviously right. There are arguments for why it could be something else. And just remember that they then have different assumptions, right? About the traits and the, the flexibility and the independent evolution of the, of the other traits, okay? But let's just assume that this is the tree. And what we'll do is we'll throw a, a question at you. And again, these are ways of flagging your learning so that you can come back and go, okay, I need to review this or I need to look at this or I need to break this down, okay? So here's uh, another multiple choice question and I will put it on the poll and then I will say goodbye and thank you and I will see you next time. But everyone is still sticking around. You'll also see me in the background. Um, um, oh, here we go. I'm going to stop sharing this. Oh, we are having internet challenges today. Um, tree thinking question. Okay. There you go. Okay. See Good you time. later. Get out. See you. Bye. So we'll give you a couple of seconds to read through that, first of all, and then try and answer it. Right, 21 quarter of you. So we will continue thinking for this uh, for a couple more minutes. Couple more seconds. Let's get up to 80%. We're at 77. Keep answering, keep answering. Remember, of course, this is a poll in Zoom. We are not evaluating this at all. This is an opportunity for you to look at the kinds of questions that we would ask in a topic test where you would be evaluated and then to act on those. So the act 
part of action of is asking yourself uh, is important. Uh, all right, 85, well done. So put your right hand up in the air, pat yourself on the back of the head, give yourself a rub on the head, rub on the stomach. Uh, well done. Going to end the poll and we're going to drag it down here. So uh, <clears throat> the majority of you, by a slight margin, have the correct answer. Shell shape has changed at least three times. Let's take some of these crazy mice actions that we've got on this screen over here. So the ancestor could not have been blue. Uh, it certainly could have been. Uh, it's very likely that Y lost a complex lure. Mm. Mm. Shell shape has changed at least three times. Well, we see whatever, when we plot the shell shape onto this tree, and then we look at the tips of the tree, at the extant taxa or species, these shapes up here, we see a variety of shapes. And so whether or not we plot, hypothesize, that back here at Z, that the ancestral shape was large or small, we inevitably, working up towards these tips, have to include in our hypotheses at least three changes in shell shape. And so that is, pardon my two mice, four screens, I'm going to get this done. Um, I see a question in the quiz. Are poll questions available somewhere on Course Link for Studying? Uh, they are available in that. They are on your, uh, in the PDFs, the lecture. So each lecture, so under content, you go to lecture and under uh, lectures, well, under content, you go to the week. Under the week, there are the two packages for the lectures. In each one of the lectures, five and six, for instance, there will be the YouTube link and the PDF uh, for each one of these conversations, discussions. So these kinds of plots are excellent study practice. And the kinds of questions we're asking, one of the excellent ways that we have to propose to you to continue to study for this class and for the topic tests for ecology, for evolution, uh, then ecology and then physiology, is to try and we're modeling kind of um, by asking you these questions in the polls the kinds of questions that we're going to ask in the topic tests. And in fact, the best way to study for those is not to try and memorize things, is to try and make these kinds of questions. So excellent study practice is to take a look at this phylogeny or go and Google phylogeny of fill in the blank. Use whatever your favorite taxon is. If it's seahorses, that's lovely. If it's sawflies, that's lovely. Uh, if it's birds, well, fine. Okay, lots of people like birds. I think they're delicious. Um, and try and write these kinds of questions, these kinds of questions. Then study together as a group. Get some friends, some acquaintances, four or five people perhaps that you just share a living space with. And you try and write questions for the rest. And if you each come to that study session with, say, four or five questions about some phylogenies that you found in this particular topic test, you're going to be well on your way. That's going to be a much more effective way for you to study than trying to memorize, wait, what was it with the lures and the shell shapes? I mean, use this as an example, but then go and find your own and try and write your own. Okay, so this is um, one of the cool things that hopefully that shell shape question made you come up with for the third of you that, that suggested that it was the right answer was the fact that, wait a second, the shell shape, if it changed, it could be lost. It could change back. And so traits can be lost. This is one of the uh, elements of evolution that sometimes people aren't as intuitively uh, attracted to or even not intuitively, but just like from a pedagogical, from an education perspective, you're not exposed to it. So if we talk about this trait being a circle that is open, okay, so an open circle. Now along one lineage, and we'll say that the open circle is the ancestral trait, and we see a speciation event in two branching lineages that come up here and here, and we see that this lineage on the right-hand side of the screen has retained the ancestral trait of being an open circle. On the left hand, um, so on the left hand side, we see a subsequent branching of speciation event where the derived trait of being a filled circle has evolved. And as we follow that lineage along, we see subsequent branching events where this derived trait is maintained in the lineage on the right 
So the more recently ancestral, remember in this phylogeny there are multiple monophyletic groups that we can talk about. Uh, but on the left hand side, we see that in this final speciation on the upper left side of the tree, that the derived, the more recently derived um, ancestral state or the derived condition of being a filled circle has been lost and the ancestral uh, trait uh, returns. Now, what we'd like to do, yeah, I see, I just looked over at the chat and saw the suggestion that the uh, annotations are somewhat distracting, so I will thank you uh, for your drawings and I will erase because, in fact, what I'm going to ask you to do is to jot on here or in the chat uh, some examples of a trait that has been lost in a lineage. And a reminder, like we talked about, um, is that traits can be uh, morphological, biochemical, developmental, behavioral, ecological. So... Um, chickens used to have teeth. Some fish have lost their eyes. Yes, true and true. I think there's going to be some expression of a whale here. Uh, large size. Yeah, that's a great example. Can you be um, specific? Uh, human tails, lack of. Uh, humans, use of an appendix. Canines, I'm going to move. I'm, um, as you see if you watch these later on. <laughs> Wisdom. <laughs> Oh my god, I think yes, existing in the stupidest of timelines, as we all do, or sometimes I feel like we all do, has wisdom. Is wisdom a lost trait? Let's hope not! Um, yes, horse hooves. Uh, birds have changed their... dot dot dot. Whales, yes, so I think what we're drawing there is uh, the loss of the um, set, or the reduction, we'll call it, of, uh, of the legs. These are great. These are really good examples. So I am, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> wisdom and virtue. Yeah, yeah, you've made, so applaud wherever you're sitting. If it's in the library, just do it very quietly. Applaud yourselves, pat yourselves on the head. You've got this. Um, I'm going to clear those annotations uh, and we're going to keep, because I'm going to go on to the next slide, but those were all, you're in the right ballpark for sure. Um, let's go away from there and we'll come back here and we'll say, uh, one of the key ones, and some of you had started jotting this down about the birds was the fact that one of the ways that probably I describe birds as delicious, that's not perhaps the most common way to describe birds. Uh, one of them might be, uh, in terms of flight and some birds Admittedly, this is the dirty secret about birds, is that uh, some birds don't fly. Flightlessness not only exists in birds, but it's actually kind of common. There's Dr. Jacobs um, somewhere in the South Pacific with one of the characteristic lineages of flightless birds, the penguins. But in fact, radites, ostriches, emu, kiwi, uh, kakapo, flightless ducks, rails and grebes, all over the bird phylogeny, we see examples of flightlessness as a trait. Now, one of the cool things about this is that this has uh, been observed clearly like from the time that we pushed the dodo to extinction as a, as a kind of a trait example. But even in the scientific literature, through the genetic and the genomic uh, evolution of, or development of those tools in the study of evolution, we've been intrigued by the evolution, the multiple losses of flight within birds. Here's a couple of, of examples uh, that we will break down here. Don't stamp. Please do not stamp. What we would like to do is to break down one of these examples, and you can go read about it later on. But this is a phylogeny of a particular lineage of ratite birds. Okay, so remember the ratites were the flightless birds. So what we have here is our outgroup is a chicken. We'll agree the chicken can fly. Okay, not well, but they can fly. So ratites are flightless birds. Now, nested within this blue example here, these gorgeous tinamous, uh, which I was actually just standing, I, I was walking by one in a forest in Costa Rica just over a week ago, um, they can fly. So, what we'd like you to do with your stamp tool, stretch your fingers, and you're going to get ready. You're going to annotate the tree. You place a stamp on the tree where the trait of flight 
could have been lost. Three, two, one go!" Amazing. Amazing. Okay. All right. Pause that for two seconds. Uh, we've done your right hand before. Let's do your left hand. Pat yourself on the head. That is gorgeous because I see in this, um, the cloud of votes that you have suggested a primary hypothesis. And many of you have also suggested other locations in this tree where the trait of flightlessness may have been lost. Let's clear the drawings for a second. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's move on here. So there are, in fact, multiple places where this uh, flightlessness trait could have uh, evolved, which is kind of amazing and beautiful. And I think ornithologists should talk about it more frequently. So multiple independent losses of flight. So then the question is, we've talked about clades and monophyly being kind of synonyms and monophyletic groups being a very powerful way to understand the world. Is flightless bird a monophyletic group? Throw it in the chat or on the screen. This is a yes or no question. Is flightless bird a monophyletic group? Oh my goodness, yes. Well, yes, I see in the chat you are saying no. And some of you are even saying no with exclamation marks. Some of you are more chill about it. Nope. Yep. And correct. You are correct. Okay. Now, one last example in uh, the, the final minute is the fact that flight is, of course, much older than birds. Insects are the oldest flyers. And winglessness is a trait that we have seen, not just the loss of flight uh, in many lineages, but in some lineages like phasmids or these stick insects, we've seen cases, I'll answer that question, can flight be regained? Yes. So we've seen cases where there are lineages like this uh, in the yellow boxes where their stick insects can clearly fly, lineages like this where they have very reduced wings, and then in images like in the violet boxes where stick insects cannot fly at all. And an amazing thing about this trait of winglessness is this we look across the phasmid tree of life, the stick insect tree of life, we see, <coughs> excuse me, so many examples both of the loss and the re-expression of the winged trait. This is fantastic. This is, this suggests how plastic an evolutionary response and how evolution in determining, in, in kind of winnowing in, s focusing in on a just good enough solution can still, uh, uh, can proceed by not just gains, as you've been taught or many of your friends have been taught, but by losses. Uh, Caramel's very ex excited by this. And this is connected to, if you're interested in this, uh, take 1070 or some of the insect diversity, uh, 2700 rather, invertebrate morphology and evolution, some of the insect diversity courses. One of the reasons this is possible is because the trait of being winged, there is, it's a, it's a series of Hox genes, of developmental control genes that can, that turn wings on or off. And so wingedness gets turned off, but the architecture is still there and is maintained by those lineages going forward. So I see now that we are uh, at the goodbye point. So please remember uh, to think about those attending some of the um, some of the sessions on the 30th for the Truth and Reconciliation Week. And please take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And uh, Ms. Bailey Bingham will be here in a second uh, to deal with questions. I'm going to...